Welcome to World Prophecy News. I'm Jay Gallimore. And I'm Steve Gallimore. You know, Jay, uh, over the last number of years, it has been indoctrinated in the children of this country, of the United States. It has been indoctrinated the philosophies of atheistic humanism and evolution. True. Now, you would think that after years of indoctrination that that would have taken hold and that people in America today would believe that God did not create the world, that they would believe that God really is disengaged, if He even exists, uh, in the affairs of human beings. However, a recent poll was taken. A, re a Christian study was done by a Christian research group, and they have discovered something that is absolutely amazing. And that is that even though this doctrine of atheistic humanism and evolution has been instilled in the young people of America, year after year, over and over and over again, that even though that has happened, that 70 percent, and I'm going to quote this, that almost 70 percent believe that God is, and I quote, all-knowing, all-powerful, creator of the universe who still rules the world today. Hmm. So Americans have not bought into this religion that's being taught in public schools, this religion of atheistic humanism uh, evolution. And so it, it's just absolutely amazing that people have held on that God is the creator and that He still rules in our world today. It's amazing, isn't it? Yes, it is. And of course, sometimes I think maybe it's not amazing, Steve, because when you really look at the world around you, I mean, it's just common sense that this didn't come from some, you know, tiny speck, some spark somewhere, some monkey. Uh, there's just too much to it. And I think common people with common sense look around and say, uh, yeah, right. And uh, they're just not buying it. And after, I don't, I wonder how many billions of dollars has been spent on this as well. Think of all the universities that are upheld by all of this kind of stuff in the secular world that uh, we're part of. And of course, a lot of those people don't like Christianity. That, that minority does not like Christianity, many of them. But let, go ahead. Yeah, I just heard to say, Jay, we're going to talk about some scientific issues. Yeah. Now, you're not a scientist and I'm not a scientist. No. But there are some common sense things, I think, that uh, are worthy for us to consider. And I think also that uh, people like to know what's happening. I is, is everyone in the scientific community uh, on the side of, of atheistic uh, uh, evolution? Are they there or are there other people that really are credible people, scientists, that uh, say, no, look, this could not have been an accident. There's some kind of design behind you and me. Well, that's true, and I think uh, the common sense thing comes in is I can still tell the sky is blue and not green, you know, it's kind of a thing. I think people look around, but you're absolutely right. We're not scientists, don't need to be to get into this, but there are a lot of scientists that are talking about this nowadays, and a lot of academic uh, people are, are changing their mind about Darwinism because they're being confronted with their own microscopes, they're being confronted with their own scientific data. And as they look at uh, the tiny human cells, as they look at the big universe, they are coming to conclusions that this is just not possible, Steve, unless there is a designer. Somebody is behind all of this. It just couldn't happen out of the clear blue. And so just recently there was held an intelligent design conference in the little town of Highlands, North Carolina. And there were gathered some people who had been formerly been Darwinists. In fact, I'd like to read just a little bit of the, some of the people that were there, Steve. Oh, it's an impressive list. It, isn't it, it? is. It yeah. is. There's Michael B. He, Ph.D., Lehigh University, biochemistry. Now, he, he studies what happens in that tiny cell, and it is so complicated and so marvelous. And he wrote this uh, best-selling book called Darwin's Black Box, and basically that book said, well, he, he made it real simple. You remember the mousetrap, Steve? Yes. You want to talk to us about the mousetrap for a second? Well, and once again, this is a simply, a simply a layman's uh, point of view, but the book was written for lay people. Right. But uh, I think that if I understand it correctly, that there are certain things that are, are irreducibly complex. Right. And he uses the example of a mousetrap, which of course is a, a very simple device and not thought to be very complex. But the basic idea is that even a mousetrap, that every part of that mousetrap has to be there and it has to work in the right order, it has to be placed in the right place. Uh, you know, all the little attachments have to be there just exactly in the right spot in order for that mousetrap to work. Now, if this mousetrap was formed by an accident somehow, 
the chances of that coming together in a workable form impossible. is very, very remote. It's impossible. Even though the mousetrap is very simple and even though the components that make it up are very simple, for them to organize themselves for a particular function mm. and to do that function well uh, is really mathematically a, a near impossibility or even an impossibility it is, to happen. It is. Uh, let me just go back and read a few more of these things here. Uh, a few more folk that were there. I won't read them all, of course, but here is Hugh Ross, Ph.D., is an astrophysicist, and uh, Thomas Woodward, a Ph.D., uh, uh, and here is Charles Thaxton, a Ph.D. in chemistry and considered to be the author of Mysteries of Origin and Life and the father of the intelligent design movement. And uh, there's Larry... Um, Bateman, Ph.D., at as Atmospheric uh, Science, etc. Anyway, these folk were there, and they are talking about why they no longer believe that there's any scientific support for Darwinism's, uh, Darwin's uh, concepts that everything had to be added to in small, tiny sequences, and that it's impossible. And the truth is, I haven't seen, and again, I'm not uh, into this, but I haven't seen even in uh, the lay response, a response to these men. There, there's not much of a response out there to them. Well, and these people are not necessarily Christians. Some of them are, some of them are not Christian. And they're not maybe a biblical creationists as we think of it either. That's correct. I mean, they may come from a different uh, philosophical bent, but just a as scientists, as qua a highly qualified scientists, they look at these things and they say, you know, it just could not have happened by accident. And these are people that are knowledgeable of the scientific issues. Right. I mean, there are so many scientific issues to these things. You have chemistry, and you have biology, and you have geology, and you have so many scientific issues. But these are people that are qualified to make judgments on scientific issues. And they look at this and they say, yeah, we know all the issues, but there has to be a design behind what we see today in creation. The fascinating thing about this conference is that it's pointing out, Steve, that there is a shift not among the lay people, but among acad uh, the academic world, among scientists. There's a paradigm shift going on. The ground is beginning to shake under the Darwin philosophies and theories because academia is making changes here. And one of the reasons for they're saying for that is because the human cell, not just the human cell, but uh, any cell, living cell, is so complicated that it could contain, the information contained in it, contain an entire library of books for information sources. I mean, think of it. It's just, right. it's just uh, amazing, not to speak of some of the other issues that are raised by this. Right. Well, you know, Jay, if, if people had always remembered the Sabbath day, the way Jesus told us to remember the Sabbath day. You know, mm. the Sabbath day is the memorial of creation in the Bible. Right. You go to the Ten Commandments and it says that uh, God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh day. If people had remembered the Sabbath day to keep it holy, uh, then people would not have been off on all these, uh, some of these teachings because they would have forever acknowledged that God was the Creator. Now, in saying that, I don't mean to ignore science, but, but the Sabbath, from a spiritual, a spiritual sp a standpoint, a scriptural standpoint, is extremely important. Now, we know that many have, have in, uh, in really in opposition to the scriptures, have started keeping Sunday. And, and this came out of paganism. We don't have time today to go into all of those issues. But it is true that many have forgotten to remember the Sabbath day, and, and consequently, uh, many uh, in our world today don't remember God as the Creator. There was a, an interesting thing that just happened uh, in Virginia about Sunday legislation that uh, I think our viewers will find interesting as well today. In fact, uh, Steve, it is interesting because what happened in Virginia, and they've had blue laws for a long time, uh, which means Sunday sacred laws to keep Sunday uh, holy and sacred, they were in the process of doing some revising, and in that process they accidentally went back and revived an old colonial blue law that made trade on Sunday almost impossible. In fact, it was, uh, the, the, that old law said that if an employer uh, forced his uh, employee to work on Sunday, he could be hit with criminal penalties. And so this caused quite a stir and actually became law for a little while in Virginia. Well, yeah, you know, 
interestingly enough, this thing, this thing really passed overwhelmingly, which is surprising. And, uh, and yet the governor later said, it's one of those times when we have to say, oops, you know, we messed up. But what happened was that it, it passed 36 to 0 in the Senate in Virginia. It passed 79 to 1 in what they call their House of Delegates, their, their lower house there in the state. Now, and then the ask, governor signed it into law. i got to ask a question right there. Is there only one person in the whole Virginia Senate that read the thing before they looked at well, it? I, I'm just teasing Yeah, I don't know anything about the politics in Virginia, but <laughs> what I know is that this slipped by and that the governor said, oops, we messed up. Yeah. Because what happened was in, in, in revising some of these things, they, they did this revision which said basically, that no one, no employer in Virginia uh, can employ a person on the Sabbath, uh, now Sunday, the law said the Sabbath, but obviously it's not the Sabbath, Sunday right. is not the Sabbath, we know that. But they said that a person could not, using their terminology, employ someone uh, on the Sabbath that didn't want to work on the Sabbath. Now, what happened in Virginia was that, that all of a sudden, Many, many people, it became a real problem for businesses, said, oh, we don't want to work on Sunday. Now, my question is, if these people were, rel were religiously convicted that they should not work on Sunday, uh, why did it take a state law like this where they would now have the courage to say, I don't want to work on Sunday? It seems like a lot of people just wanted to get out of work because they didn't want to work. No, but, uh, but uh, uh, you know, they didn't have the courage to stand up and say, listen, we are convicted on the Sabbath. And I think there's a good reason for that because you really can't have the conviction that Sunday is the Sabbath because it's not scriptural. Correct. And so they had really nothing to stand on. But anyway, they had all of these people now coming up and saying, oh, yeah, we, we don't want to work on Sunday. We like this law. Now, this created a real problem in the state of Virginia. And so now they've repealed this thing. And, but they still have blue laws there. Right. They, they didn't do away with the blue laws, but they did away with this particular feature of this one. Well, I think it's important, Steve, for folk to go back and read the Scripture, and you'll find there's no scriptural change there that changed God's holy Sabbath from Saturday the seventh day of the week to Sunday the first day of the week. That change was a man-made change, and as Steve pointed out earlier, we don't have time to get into that right now, but we, we want to be biblical. We want to be following the Scripture, and if people have held to that, uh, down through time, I don't think we'd ever had evolution as a problem. I don't think people would have been denying the existence of God or God as Creator. In fact, the fact that He claims to be our Creator and our Father gives Him rights over us and to us and uh, the opportunity to pour out His love on all of us as our Father. And as you keep the Sabbath, you really relate to God uh, as your Heavenly Father. If it wasn't important, Jesus never would have said in the fourth commandment, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. For in six days, God created the heaven and the earth. God wanted us to forever remember Him as the Creator God. He is the one that made us, designed us, and everything else that we see in this world. And He wanted us to always remember who was the Creator. Well, I hope as the academic world discovers God as Creator, they'll also discover His Son, the Sabbath, Steve. And this is World Prophecy News, and I'm Jay Gallimore. Thanks for being with us today for World Prophecy News. I'm Steve Gallimore.